Stranger Things Season 4 has 16 main characters carried from previous seasons, 5 mainish characters new to this season, and countless other side characters that we meet over 9 episodes. But because there are so many plot lines, some of them suffer in comparison to others with weaker characters and story beats that seem like filler. And this is too bad because you lose interest in central characters. And while this does allow other characters to shine, it's not the best use of screen time, especially with such long episodes. So I'm going to take a look at each of the main plot lines and discuss which characters I think are watered down and maybe some ideas of how we could improve them. While this video is going to be more negative, I genuinely really enjoyed season four overall. I think it was a great season. It's probably my second favorite one next to season one, but it isn't perfect. And I think it's fun to discuss what could make a good show even better. Just a quick disclaimer, I'm just focusing on the characters I think are the weakest in each plot line. So even if there are inconsistencies or decisions I didn't necessarily agree with with the stronger characters, I'm not going to discuss that here. For now, we're just going to look at the characters I think they did a disservice to. Without a doubt, the Californian storyline is definitely the weakest one out of all of them. It follows Will, Mike, Jonathan, and Argyle on their journey to find Eleven and the Nina Project. So let's start with Will. Throughout season four, Will doesn't do much. It almost feels as if he's a background character rather than a part of the core crew. His impact on the plot is quite minor, and for someone who's been through so much as Will, he deserves a lot more growth and purpose. If we look at Will's story before season four, he is is quite central to most events, even if he has less screen time. He is the first to be abducted to the Upside Down, and when he's rescued, he brings the Upside Down with him. He's then bullied even more by kids at school who call him Zombie Boy. He's used as a vessel for the Mind Flayer, or Vecna, and after a traumatizing battle, develops a connection to him. Will is also slow to grow up, holding onto his childhood, and feels like an outsider when his friends are more interested in girls than D&D. But he puts that aside when he realizes they're in danger. And there are also also hints throughout the seasons that he might be gay. His drawing skills are usually key in solving mysteries. He's the son of a hardworking single mom, but also a toxic, abusive dad. And when a healthy father figure is brought into the picture, it doesn't last long. Will is kind, soft-spoken, artistic, and resilient. In season four, he's moved to Lenora Hills, California. He's still passive and presumably bullied, or at least still feeling like an outsider, but still wants to be there for those that he loves, especially in the beginning, where he supports of Elle but can't verbally stand up for her. But since he's not in Hawkins, he's disconnected from the Upside Down, and so his main conflict isn't fighting the Mind Flayer, it's his feelings for Mike. And this is something that I'm conflicted about. Because on one hand, I think that Will quietly dealing with his sexuality can be consistent with previous seasons, and it makes sense to deal with this now that he's a little bit older and a teenager. However, I didn't love the idea of him being being in love with Mike specifically. There's two main reasons for this. One is I just don't love love triangles. And the other is while there definitely could be hints that Will is gay, there weren't really any hints for his feelings for Mike. Yes, they were best friends, but that doesn't necessarily equal romantic feelings. And if you think about it, these very strong in love feelings actually come a little bit out of the blue. I think for me, I would have preferred Will's conflict to be Will and Mike having to work on building their friendship back up again. And you could definitely still have the added layer of Will being closed off because he's afraid that Mike won't accept him with his sexuality struggle because there is a tension with both of them in the beginning of the season, but it's resolved very quickly. And like, yeah, why did Will never call Mike? That's not necessarily a sign of a good friend and maybe Mike wants him to try a little bit harder. Maybe they have to learn to trust each other again 
after being apart for so long. Maybe Will has to learn to be more vocal or assertive and maybe that confidence would be a skill in fighting Vecna later, whether it's in this season or season five. Mike and Will actually don't have a huge moment of reconciliation in season three, so it's totally possible that this is something they still have to work through. And if they still wanted to explore his sexuality, I think I would rather he had subtle hints of maybe checking out a guy on their road trip or just avoiding talking about girls. And maybe those hints are the things that his brother would pick up on eventually. I guess one thing that makes this love triangle a little bit more bearable for me, even though I still don't really love it, is that it's very clearly doomed because Will knows he likes Mike, but he can't ever say it because he knows that Mike is going to be with Elle. And so he just does whatever is best for Mike. He's supportive in the only way that he can be, even though it breaks him. I also like he's never actually jealous of Eleven, although he doesn't appreciate her lying to Mike. I just like that they didn't add unnecessary drama there. I also think that Will and his drawings still having a through line this season is nice. I like that they keep that skill set for him and that it actually does serve a purpose. In this case, it is motivating Mike, which then helps Eleven fight Vecna. However, this is really his only impact on the plot is this painting. And it's just not a massive thing. I guess despite having such a minor role this season, it does look like he's going to be playing a bigger role in season five, which I'm very excited for. I want Will to have his moment in the spotlight again. Then we have Jonathan, who is of course Will's older brother. And Jonathan, I think is probably the weakest character in this entire season. I actually think he's more of a non-character really because Jonathan doesn't really serve any purpose to the story other than being a chauffeur. At the start of the season, Jonathan is introduced as a stoner now, but this doesn't really come back into the plot except for having a stoner friend who ends up having a bigger impact on the plot than he does. Jonathan's conflict this season is being avoidant and dishonest with Nancy because he has decided to go to a different college than her, prioritizing being closer with his family. And he's really afraid to tell her because he doesn't want her to abandon her dreams for him. Now, I actually think this is not a bad conflict for Jonathan to have. I think that because they're in a long distance relationship, it's totally fair for Nancy and Jonathan to be having relationship problems, but it also felt like a very easy way to open up the door for another love triangle, which I thought was a bit odd because in seasons one through three, Nancy and Jonathan to me were so clearly endgame and I really like them together. And I'm also incredibly biased because I love Steve. I just need him to like be happy. And I really, 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 really was hoping for Steve to get his own girl this season. She had her chance, honestly, and she gave you up. You deserve somebody who is 100% committed to you. Anyway, so it opens up the door for like this whole Nancy and Steve relationship, love triangle with Jonathan. And this is really also not talked about a lot. Jonathan really only brings it up once with Argyle. And so it's not really something that we can get invested in. There is only one scene that I liked with Jonathan. And this is when he notices Will's emotions and maybe assumes that he's gay or at least struggling with something. And then later in the pizzeria, he has a heart to heart with him. And this moment is very sweet. It's very heartwarming because if we look back at season one, Will is so close to his brother. And it was Jonathan who showed him the song, Should I Stay or Should I Go? when their parents were fighting. And it's this song that becomes Will's lifeline in the Upside Down, which is a parallel to this season, which is quite cool. But I think that with both Will and Jonathan, they could have made them more interesting and more emotionally stronger this season. If they explored that brother dynamic more, it would make a lot of sense because they both become very distant, especially with Jonathan becoming a stoner and Will having this internal struggle with his sexuality. Then instead of Jonathan telling us that he's been distant from Will, we would actually see that struggle and then that conversation would be a little bit stronger and then so would their relationship. And maybe they don't fully resolve it. Maybe they just make baby steps so we can cover it more in season five. And you might think like, is this really necessary for the plot? Would it be too much to focus on all of this relationship building when there is so much other story to tell? And I think my answer would be yes, because Stranger Things is half about the evil of the upside down and then half a coming of age show. I know that there is so much other story to tell that I would want these
these moments to be like very short. For example, we can take some short scenes of Max and Lucas to show that you don't actually need a lot of screen time to convey a lot of information because they're also a good example of a distant relationship. In episode one, there are just very quick moments that establish what they're going through. Max sees Lucas in the hallway with a blank expression and Lucas seems worried and almost caught off guard. Lucas invites her to his basketball game and tries to offer help and Max refuses both and references their breakup. At the pep rally, she looks disinterested and never shows up to the game and Lucas is disappointed. These are all quick flashes that establish the distance, coldness, and friction between them. Lucas tries to reach out but offends her. Max thinks she can handle this herself. Then over the season, there are several short scenes that bond them closer. Obviously, they go through way more so I wouldn't expect the same depth and time with Jonathan and Will or Will and Mike but I think it would have been possible to weave some of those short moments into the Californian plot as they drive around searching for Elle. Also, Jonathan's photography passion isn't brought up again but this, I don't know, that's fine. I don't know how you would have added it into the season but that's just like another thing about Jonathan that would make him more interesting and we just kind of forget about it. Then we have Argyle who is Jonathan's new stoner friend and I think this is very unpopular but <laughs> just Argyle wasn't my favorite character and I know a lot of people really loved him but I think the main reason for me is that a lot of his jokes just didn't land for me and I think maybe he's like just too goofy. I'm not sure. I don't know. Maybe he'll grow on me in season five and I think that if we take Argyle out of the picture, Jonathan would have a lot more to do. He would actually have an impact on the plot. He could have been the one to have a job at the pizzeria and offer the freezer or maybe as he goes to smoke a joint, he notices the tracks towards Nina. That way, he's a character that would actually help move the story forward, especially since he is one of the main characters from the first season. I will say that Argyle does add a lightheartedness to what might have been like an otherwise serious crew. And even though Argyle, I was just very bland towards, I do find it very endearing that he just never asked a single question about anything. He just accepted every single bizarre situation. And then the last character I want to talk about in the Californian plotline is Mike. Mike is very much the golden good boy. He is the leader of the original crew of kids. He has always been accepting of the differences of others. He was the first to accept Elle for being unique when everyone else was skeptical. Mike's main conflict this season is that he can't say that he loves Elle to her because he's afraid she won't need him anymore. So he's dealing with a lot of doubt and insecurity. This is a natural progression for Mike because he's always been so protective. In season one, he protected her from anyone finding her. In season two, he tried to reach her every day for a year because of his devotion to her. In season three, he was protective of overusing her powers to the point of her burning out and with the fear of losing her again. So it makes sense that now she's becoming her own person and somewhat settling into society that he feels useless. Expressing his feelings is also probably hard because he's still just an awkward teenage boy and being vulnerable isn't easy. But more importantly, I think that this overprotectiveness and worry for Elle could be more interesting if it expanded to how it affects his relationship with others, which they do touch on a little bit in season three, especially with Will. There is that subtle conflict with him in the beginning, like I mentioned, and I really wish this was drawn out. Maybe Mike needs to realize that by only prioritizing Elle, he doesn't know his friend anymore. Maybe he senses something is different about Will, but has terrible communication skills, which we've seen with Elle, so can't bring it up with him and avoids it. Maybe he is resentful of Will for not trying to keep the relationship together and doesn't want to have to do all of the work. Or maybe he remembers when Will destroyed Castle Byers and is feeling some guilt over that because it was right after he was a bit of a jerk to him. Considering that Mike values friendship so highly that before he would literally throw himself off a cliff to save a friend, it would be interesting to test that devotion now. Mike's obsessiveness with Elle also makes him very oblivious sometimes. I mean, poor Will is bawling his eyes out in this car and like <laughs> Mike couldn't even say thank you. Through Will's words, Mike is able to confess his feelings for Elle in this very sweet speech, which in turn helps Elle fight off Vecna. So my overall thoughts on Mike are that in theory, I think he's fine, but that's it. He's just kind of 
bland. He doesn't really have much to do anymore because he's really just a side piece to Al. He isn't with the crew in Hawkins, so he can't really demonstrate his leadership skills or be the heart of the team, although he eventually kind of sort of does that. But honestly, I'm not sure if there is anything else that could have been done with him, except maybe spending some time working through his friendship with Will. But maybe pulling him away from the center a little bit will make it more rewarding when the crew is back together again in season five. The Russian subplot is my second to least favorite one and mainly I personally was really looking forward to learning more about the Russians. What are they doing? They've been here since season one and we still don't know much about them. I mean, we're assuming or at least I'm assuming that they're making weapons to fight America or take over the world or something, but clearly, you know, they might have ulterior motives. Like how much do they know about the upside down? I really wanted to focus more on the Russian side of things, but instead it is focused on breaking in and out of the Russian prison multiple times. So I think with this plot line, what makes it the weakest is more so the plots rather than the characters, but I want to go through them anyway and break them down. So let's start with Joyce Byers. So Joyce is of course the protective and loving mother of the Byers boys. In season four, Joyce's main conflict is getting Hopper back while dealing with the crazy swindler Yuri who is demanding $40,000 in exchange for Hopper. And I think similar to Mike, Joyce isn't necessarily a bad character. I still really like her. It's just the situations that she's in aren't that interesting and drag out quite a bit. I miss the protective mother character for Will in earlier seasons. We don't see much of that because she's separated from the kids. Although to be fair, if we're gonna have somebody go and get Hopper back, Joyce is probably the most obvious choice. I think the thing with Joyce is that I always really liked her character because she seemed like this frazzled crazy woman but she's always right even if her ideas are a little bit out there. Will actually was speaking to her through Christmas lights. The mind flare was in the videotape. The magnets do mean something and it's her fierce devotion and protectiveness that helps fight off these threats. This is carried in season four with her persistent belief that Hopper is alive but instead of slowly figuring out more details and making progress, Joyce is mostly put in positions that circle around her end goal. So instead of us being invested in the next piece of information she finds, she has all of the information she needs, or at least the means to get there. And it's just a yo-yo effect that goes back and forth with Yuri. I do wish there was some mention of Joyce grieving for Hopper, but I understand if they had to cut that out due to time and there's a big time jump, so it makes sense. When Joyce and Hopper reunite, it is a very sweet, tender moment. They're little conversation about their date is like so cute. I think this buildup paid off quite well. Eventually the crew finds out that something is wrong in Hawkins and that the kids might be in danger so Joyce suggests that the only way to help them is to attack the hive mind. Okay so I guess this is an okay way to tie all of the plots together and we do get this scene which is phenomenal but we've fought demogorgons before, we've fought demodogs before and I also think that Joyce being out side of the prison and Hopper being inside, this could have created an interesting dynamic of gathering that Russian intel from the inside and using that to help the kids while also trying to get Hopper out. And maybe this whole thing is still done with Enzo's help. It could still be cryptic so that they don't know Hopper is alive until they have their face-to-face -face meeting. Joyce does have her usual charm, but it just didn't stand out as much this season. I think in season five, I'd love to see her protectiveness again with her boys, maybe her relationship to Elle as a mother figure, finally having a healthy relationship with Hopper along with whatever Russian or upside down mystery they have to solve. Even though I think this plot drags out a little bit, I do realize that not all the plots can be as exciting as every other one. I'd love to know what you think if you thought the Russian storyline was good or repetitive or how you would have done it differently. Then there's Murray and Yuri. And so Murray, of course, teams up with Joyce to break Hopper out. And you know, I really like 
liked Murray in season two and season three. I think he's a great, like, he's a funny character, like this kooky conspiracy theorist guy who's just like kind of random with the skills that he knows. But I think with him, I prefer him in a little bit more smaller doses. And I think in season four, there's just a little bit too much of him, especially with the fact that Yuri feels like a very similar character with very similar energy, just like times a hundred. And he is also helpful in the fact that he speaks Russian and does karate. But honestly, this might sound really bad, but I was hoping for a bigger death count for season four, and I honestly would have been fine if Murray died. And lastly, we have Enzo, which I know he has a different name, but I'm just going to be calling him Enzo because he looks like an Enzo to me. So Enzo is a guard of the Russian prison who helps Hopper escape, which is initially for selfish reasons. He wants the money, but eventually he does befriend him and they're thrown in jail together. I do like Enzo. So he is like, I feel like he's just so cool. Every time this actor is on screen, I just think he's just so cool. Like he just has a very like cool vibe about him and he has great chemistry with Hopper, but I think he could have been better because he does help Hopper escape. But other than that, he doesn't really have any other impact on the plot other than being someone for Hopper to monologue to. And like going back to my need for more info on my Russians, I feel like Enzo would have been such a good character who had like extra intel on what the Russians are doing. Maybe he's someone who doesn't know everything, but he's overheard like what they're planning or can offer some sort of interesting insight to the team that would have helped fight the monsters or the Russians. Maybe they didn't want to expand on the Russian villains because now there are so many evil forces with Vecna and the US army and the Demogorgons and I don't know, other like side villains like Jason and Angela, whatever. But anyway, that's that's what I was hoping for this season and we just didn't get it. For the Nina project story, I actually thought this was a pretty strong story. I enjoyed most of the characters. I think a lot of them are generally very strong. Although, <laughs> Mr. Martin Brenner is skating on very thin ice coming back from the dead. I, mm, I don't know. I mean, I'll accept it because I liked him in this season. I think he should have been there for like Elle's character arc. It was fine, but it's questionable. All right, it was questionable. He, I, you're telling me he didn't die in season one. I don't know, <laughs> but it's fine. I'm gonna. I'm I'm gonna just let it slide because you know what? I liked him this season. Really, the weakest thing in this plot line, I think for me, or the weakest character is the threat of the US Army with this sergeant. Sullivan feels a bit disjointed with the rest of the story because the characters aren't really fleshed out to the point where it feels like a real or intimidating threat. I think you kind of know that they're not really going to get Eleven. The helicopter crash was cool. Like that was fun. That was a good moment. I guess that now they have Sam the doctor. I'm curious to know what will happen there. And I'm assuming that there's going to be some big battle in season five. And so maybe the US army will have to come in for an actual war. So maybe it was like good to set them up. But in contrast to the other side villains that are set up in this season and previous seasons, he just doesn't have the same build up or scare tactics that make me invested. The last plot line is the Hawkins storyline, and this is my favorite favorite plot line. I think it has some of the best characters and there are only two that I can think of that could have just been a little bit better which are Robin and Jason. Robin was initially introduced in season three working at Scoops Ahoy with Steve and I loved her. I was so happy to see she joined the crew this season as a regular. In general I don't like hate Robin in season four but where the problem comes in for me is that she's just very different than in season three. Her personality seems very inconsistent because in season three, Robin is sarcastic and sort of like this alternative cool girl who's also a little bit nerdy and a bit of an outcast because she is the band geek, but she also constantly teases Steve, who is like the ultimate cool guy from making fun of how many kids he's friends with to how he can never get a girl. Robin is also curious and a problem solver. She is the one who cracks 
the Russian code by using her language skills. After going through some shared trauma with Steve, Robin eventually lets him know that she does not like him, she likes girls. And I love how that scene makes a cameo in season four where Tammy actually comes in and sings. I thought that was really cute. Anyway, in season four, Robin becomes more of the hyper clumsy neurotic friend. In season four, she says she doesn't have a filter or a strong grasp of social cues, but she seemed very self-aware and capable in season three. And I think a lot of people might defend Robin's change in character to be reflecting that she's just more comfortable and her true self around the crew instead of putting up this cool girl facade that she had in season three, which that could definitely be a believable thing. But I think for me, it's one thing to hide your quirks and goofy awkward side. It's another thing to suddenly be uncoordinated and lacking social cues when previously she made fun of Steve's social unawareness with girls. So to me, it felt like the writers wanted to add a little bit more goofiness to the crew, especially with Nancy and their whole little escapade. Now, okay, there is mention of Robin being hyper. Steve does say that she's hyper in season three and she does get very nervous and jittery when she sees Elle's wound. So these traits aren't necessarily uncharacteristic. They're just extra heightened in season four to the point where it's like all of the time rather than in very specific scenes. So it just felt a little bit too much, a little bit too different than her personality in season three. Robin's conflict this season is that she has a crush on Vicky, but she has no idea if Vicky likes her back or if Vicky even likes girls. And so it's quite the dilemma. And now I think Vicky is such a little cutie. She's like a little button. She's so adorable. But I do think that Vicky is very similar to Robin. She's kind of like Robin 2.0. And I don't know if I love that pairing. Generally though, I did find Robin's story quite fun. I loved when her and Nancy went to solve the Victor Creel mystery. And they made such a great duo because they both balanced each other out quite well. They both had the same equal amount of problem solving power. I also really loved her speech to the mental hospital's director. It's a little callback to her drama and improv skills. And it's a really persuasive story that she makes up on the spot. Lastly, we have Jason. And I actually don't have that much to say about Jason. I think he is typically a pretty decent character. It's very clear what he stands for. I only have a couple things to say about him, but for the most part, I thought he was pretty good. Jason is the very righteous jock golden boy of the high school. He is the boyfriend of Chrissy who does not make it past the first episode. He finds out that Chrissy was with Eddie and immediately assumes that Eddie is the killer. Then he finds out that Eddie is a part of Hellfire, which is a D&D club, which he assumes to be a cult. And so him and his little jock friends go on this witch hunt to hunt down Eddie. And this is a little homage to Satanic Panic, which is an actual thing that happened in the 80s. People thought that kids playing D&D would mess with their minds because they would confuse fantasy and reality. It makes sense for Jason to become so obsessed and vicious because he loved Chrissy and now that she's gone, he wants to avenge her while also fulfilling his hero fantasy. Jason actually believes he's a good guy with good morals and to the normal person he is. It's only because he's ignorant of the upside down that we know his actions aren't as well intentioned as he thinks they are. Jason also really enjoys having TED talks and motivational speeches, particularly focused on how the death of others is really encouraging for anybody to get motivated about anything. Because why did people die in a mall fire? It clearly was a sacrifice so that we could win our basketball game tonight. If anyone is having a little bit of satanic panic, I think it's Jason. Now, one of these speeches happens at a town hall because people are starting to question the validity of the police. And so Jason gets up and accuses the police for excuses and lies and persuades the whole town to agree with him. And the only thing I'll say with this is that I wish there was slightly more footage of the town just going crazy and fully believing in this satanic panic idea. We really just get this one scene and the guy that walks out and then that same guy is the one that notices Erica in the playground. But I wish we saw more distress in the streets that would really 
drive home this fear that all of the townspeople are having, not just Jason and his crew, and this one random guy that was walking his dog. Because after motivating the town to agree with him, I kind of want to see the aftermath of that. When Jason learns that there are people at the Creel house, he goes there, and to his surprise, Lucas is there, and Max is in some weird-ass trance. And I really like that Jason fully believes that he is doing the right thing by asking Lucas to get her out of the trance. He clearly is caring for Max. Him and Lucas have this very epic battle and after the whole thing with Vecna, he is split in half and killed. The only thing I wish was slightly different, but I don't think you could do this in any way, would be if Jason saw Eddie and realized that Eddie and like Lucas and the whole D&D crew had nothing to do with these murders and he's like, oh my god, I was wrong and then he just dies. <laughs> that would make everything come full circle for Jason. In general though, I think where Stranger Things fails some of its characters in season four is that there are just too many of them. With already such long run times, it wasn't possible to fit everything in and to give everyone equal treatments. I really like that Stranger Things adds these new interesting characters each season. I really liked the introduction of Eddie and Chrissy and Jason and Angela, but they have to be mindful to not forget about the core cast, the characters that are central to the story. I think Stranger Things is the strongest when they have the core characters that meet up every once in a while and then split off into new groups so we can see how the different dynamics play out and what the characters learn from each other, which the Hawkins story does really well. But you can't do that with everyone when the other three groups are in three separate places. I think season four is something new. We got to get out of Hawkins and see the world a bit, but I'm excited to bring everyone closer together in season five and go back to its roots. Overall though, I think you can probably tell that I still really enjoyed season four. Even the characters that are a little bit weaker, there are still so many things that I found interesting or compelling about them. I'd love to know your thoughts. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Are there some characters I mentioned that you thought were actually perfect and very strong? Do you have any ideas of how you would change it if you wanted to make it a bit better? Let me know. I hope you have a lovely day, a good night, and thank you so much for watching.